Paul Buchanan, as some of you may know, is a world-recognized economist. He has been involved uh, in a large number of transport-related issues around the world. He has been recognized for his work in wider economic uh, benefits, his work in terms of the economics and the potential growth requirements of cities and the transport component that that uh, requires to allow growth as an enabler and also the importance of the transport interface for both the commercial but also social and environmental issues around uh, city development. As I said, Paul's background is in economics. We don't hold that against him, but we look forward to a broader, as someone who spends much of their life talking to engineers, it's probably uh, be a pleasant change, still numbers in a different form. Uh, but we will look forward to Paul's perspective in terms of uh, not just the global framework that he brings to this discussion, but starts to focus down into the Auckland perspective, what makes sense here, what are the local conditions, the local requirements, the local attitudes, the local behaviours that make New Zealand unique and the reason we choose to live here and not in Brussels or Amsterdam or London or somewhere else? And what are the principles that would apply here as opposed to there in terms of our uh, transport requirements and our development requirements as we look forward into the future, remembering that we're making decisions now that could take us forward 30, 50, 100 years. And to put that in perspective, you need to start to cast your mind back 50 to 100 years and say, would you have envisaged Auckland the way it is today back then? Some of you might be able to see back almost that far. Um, and so we need to actually stop and think about the reality of what we're trying to project, the significance of the decisions, and the boldness that is required in some of these decision makings so that we do have something that enables us to accommodate the future as opposed to defend the past. Um, Paul, we're very pleased that you've um, come this side of the world, taken the time to um, invest in us. Thank you very much. And we look forward to hearing what you've got to say in terms of transport, uh, not only in the cities of the world, but specifically in Auckland. Paul Buchanan, thank you. Thanks, David. Made my topic a bit larger than I'd anticipated and uh, given me the big build-up, so we'll see how things go. But evening, a pleasure to be here. <coughs> and I'm going to give you a kind of a general talk about transport in cities with a, with a bit of uh, interesting stuff amongst it. So I'm going to talk a little bit about transport issues, some current trends, some, some kind of difficult, hard-to-predict behaviours that come out of it. I'm going to talk about cities and economics and, and density and, and the links between those. And then some final thoughts on, on Auckland and what it might mean for us here. We passed a tipping point in 2007, apparently. I don't know how, quite how people measure this. But in 2007, more than half the world's population was living in a city. First time that's happened. And the prediction, frighteningly, is that 70% of the world's population will live in cities by 2050. So that's almost a 50% growth and population is growing as well. So the cities are going to have to cope with some pretty phenomenal growth in people. Auckland perhaps facing less problems than, than Shanghai and Mumbai and, and Rio, but, but nonetheless facing problems in, in how you deal with that. And transport has a key role to play in that. Transport can define the, the shape and the functions of your city in, in a way that's not really recognised. So I'm going to do two bits about transport, some behavioural stuff and some links to development, which is a key, key issue. First, the behavioural stuff. I found this really interesting. In the UK, and here, and, and in most countries in the world, we invest in transport on the basis of time savings. So we test a new road or a new railway or a new bus service, and we say that saves users five minutes on their journey to work, and we value that, and we compare that value to the cost and decide whether it's good or bad. This is what's happened to travel time in the UK since 1970. It actually goes back a bit further than that. 
then you can notice three things. One, the number of trips made per person per year is fixed, doesn't really change. The second, and the really interesting one, is that the time spent per person per year is also almost exactly fixed. So it's about 300, you call it 365 hours a year, i.e. an hour a day is the average that people spend. Now all this time we've been investing billions of pounds a year on the basis of time savings, but there aren't any. There are no time savings at all. What people do is they travel further. You make transport faster, they move further away and commute longer distances and travel further to see their friends and go on holiday further away, but, but they don't take those benefits as time savings. And time savings is a slightly strange way to measure that impact, which may be more of a locational preference. Oh, look, I can live with a bigger garden and a nicer house and a view, which I couldn't get on the edge of a city. But that outward sprawl is, is coming largely from transport schemes that focus on speed and, and enable it to go. One final bit, which I think is my next slide, is you'll notice a little dip in, in total travel right at the end of that. Because another big, big global trend, another one that we haven't seen for a long time, since the 30s, I guess, car use has exploded and, and gone racing up and up and up. And just now, just around 2005, it started to dip. And it started to dip not in one country, but in lots of countries. I just picked a few out at random. But it's dipping in America, dipping in Germany, dipping in UK, even dipping in Australia, I think. I haven't got the data for New Zealand, but, but the trend is, is broadly similar. So perhaps that moment of peak car is, is, is kind of upon us which would be a big change. Remember, all future transport studies tend to just take straight line extrapolations of growth by each mode. And yet that's not what, what history suggests transport does. New modes come and they, they, they can kick the old modes out pretty rapidly. So, so buses killed trains for a while and then trains came roaring back. But, but demand is not static in that way. It's quite tricky. And a few other tricky things that, that kind of have major impacts on what we're doing, I think. One is public opposition to, to building anything, really. So the UK d discovered NIMBYs, not in my backyard, and, and all sorts of things come out of that, and it's very difficult to build. But we moved on from NIMBYs, we got even better at that, and we started calling ourselves bananas which means builds absolutely nothing anywhere near anybody. <laughs> and that's kind of our strategy at the moment. I mean, I don't think we've built a major road in London since the M25, and the M25 wasn't in London, it went round the outside, but that's, that's 25 years ago. So London's gone completely the other way. All we do now is take away road space from cars. We give it to buses, we give it to cyclists, we give it to pedestrians, but, but there is no, no point in adding highway capacity to a city centre because it'll just flood. It'll be exactly as busy afterwards, just with a few more cars stuck in the jams. Emissions and environment are also coming more importantly, very importantly politically, don't really come through in the economics, disappointingly. I always quote changes in emissions in tonnes because that sounds quite you know, dramatic and large to me. But when you put it in pounds, it comes out as very little and I'm sure it comes out as very little in dollars. But, but nonetheless, those environmental impacts are important. And finally, there's safety. And this is just to illustrate quite how perverse the world is and how difficult to predict. But uh, there was a scandal a few years ago in the papers because it was discovered that insurance companies were charging more insurance for cars with ABS, automatic braking systems, than for the same model without ABS. And yet ABS is a safety mechanism. ABS means you can stop and you will not skid, so you will stop as fast as you can. How can this be? Insurance companies ripping off honest British motorists was the headline. And yet actually, of course, the insurance companies weren't doing that. They were following the accident records. And as it turns out, drivers that have ABS in their cars tend to drive like lunatics because they feel completely safe because I've got the fastest stopping car on the road. Nothing can hit me, which has two problems. One, 
it may not, still may not be as fast as you think it is, so you still may hit the car in front, and B, the one behind you, he can't stop as fast as you do, so he goes and crashes up your back. So making cars safer may actually have perverse impacts and make them more dangerous, which leads to the solution to all road safety issues, which is to put a large metal spike pointing straight at your chest, <laughs> and then there would be no accidents. Everyone would drive very, very cautiously indeed. So be careful how you think about these things because often the impacts that come out in the end are, are not quite the ones that, that you think they might be. My key point though for this talk really is about transport and development patterns and how those two are linked together. Basically when we do a transport appraisal we are given a fixed land use, fixed population, fixed employment, and you test alternative transport schemes against that. So the transport has no impact, and it's, it's completely wrong. All transport changes development patterns in different ways, though, and in a sort of simplistic way. Roads create low-density sprawl. Roads create the same level of accessibility across that road network, and development sprawls at relatively low density. Railways have a few particular points where they deliver very high accessibility, they're called stations, and development clusters around those stations in much higher densities than it ever does around road because there's only one point to get on that railway and then you've got to go another two kilometres before the next point, so you, so you get clusters. In city centres that, that tends to be commercial high density, but in res suburban residential areas also you can see that pattern of much higher density around railway stations. Buses have much less impact on development patterns and where they do it's more like roads, but it tends to be dominated by the car effect on roads. Those two issues are really important because when you build your railway and you get a load of de new development coming in around the stations, that boosts the performance of your <coughs> railway. It's a really good thing to happen. You get more passengers, your railway continues to run at the same speed. In fact, it does even better because the more demand, the more trains you have to run, the higher frequencies, so wait times go down, so it's an even more attractive service. So as demand goes up, railways become more competitive and better. Cars and roads, on the other hand, it works exactly the opposite way. So you build a new road which solves the transport, the traffic problem that you thought you had and then a load of development happens along the road and what happens? It clogs it up and the road starts going slower and eventually it grinds down to the same speed that all the other roads are at and there are no benefits to that road that you've got. You've got a load of development along it, low density sprawling development, but you end up with very little transport benefit left. So those two work in diametrically opposite directions that affect good for public transport, bad for roads. Does rail affect development patterns? Well, I'm not sure this is a perfect example, but I've got good pictures. So. This is uh, Canary Wharf on the Isle of Dogs. The Isle of Dogs was the old London docks, which fell out of use because it was too far up the river. The boats come the, the late 50s couldn't get there anymore. And so it was completely shut down. And you got left with a load of stuff like this. And in 1980, they set up the London Docklands Development Corporation to, to rebuild Docklands. And LDDC in, in mid-80s, or perhaps, perhaps even 83, came up with a, a development plan which was really based on low density light industrial sheds. This is an old industrial area that seemed appropriate. And they set up the Docklands Light Railway as a way to, to link those, those light industrial sheds with, with labor. Then, in 87, Canary Wharf Group came along and said, we'd like to build a big tower, please. And there were a lot of tax breaks and, and other incentives to build it in that place. And there were a lot of reasons why that worked, but mostly because the, the city of London w was old and it didn't have giant floor plates that apparently the, the electronic trading of banks requires. So they built this, kind of you know, in the middle of nowhere really, except for the small light rail system that was, that was serving it. It was way too much, DLR was, was hugely overloaded, but it was what gave rise to the Jubilee Line extension, which was my first big railway appraisal and uh, 
God knows why they let me in charge of it. I knew very little. But uh, I didn't really understand what that railway was about. I was very confused because I spent all this time adding up numbers and discounting them and turning them into user benefits and time savings. And it was very bad. It was about 0.9 benefit cost ratio. And they built it. And I was like, well, why am I wasting my life doing this arcane calculations and they don't take any notice? But of course they built it because first this happened and that was just before JLE opened. And then it really exploded once JLE did open and it suddenly had a proper metro that was delivering 40,000 people an hour to, to that spot. And we got to there and that's roughly where we are no, no, I think we've even got a few more than that. So we're a bit past that now. Here we go. We've just about got all of this, apart from these two big ones north of the dock. The development happened again once Crossrail was announced. Because again, post-JLE, the Isle of Dogs grew so big, again, the Jubilee and the DLR couldn't cope, so a further railway was required. And that was Crossrail. And once Crossrail opens, it's, it's going to double again. It's, it's so it created this huge, very, very dense, very successful, very wealthy, lots of high paying jobs in there, cluster of, of financial services, not in the city, interestingly, about five, six kilometres away from the city. So quite difficult to do. You can explain most of the variation in employment density in London through one simple measure of public <coughs> transport accessibility. So again, when you say does transport infrastructure affect density, yes, massively. All this is is, is the accessibility, an accessibility score for the 1,050 zones in the London transport model and the density of employment within those zones. So at low densities, or at low levels of accessibility, Employment is, is universally low. Yeah, and you get some little, these, these will be regional shopping centres that have little cluster of, of jobs, but, but not other jobs. And of course, this is central London and, and the city and the West End and the really dense bits in the middle. And they're the ones that are best served by the transport. You can simplify that diagram a little bit and say, actually, within that, there are two types of employment, two broad types. One is population related, right? they serve people, they're clients of people. And they are the retail and the solicitors and the estate agents and the restaurants and the bars and, and this, that and the other. And there's this cluster in the middle, this mobile employment. That's the one that likes to cluster and their clients are businesses, that's why they cluster. They, they feed off each other, they need each other to, to be successful. And that's the bit that really makes the money for you in your economy. Yeah? These guys are just churning the money round and round that is created somewhere. But these are the ones that create some wealth for the, for the whole economy, not just for the city. So that established approach of straight line growth, values of time, no change in pop and imp, it's really weak, doesn't work very well, doesn't reflect what happens in reality. In reality, we start by saying, okay, that's the population, that's the employment, we get these flows between them, what transport do we need to resolve that? It's just as much the other way. What transport you put in sets the population and employment patterns. For city centres, you can't do it with roads. It's got to be public transport. Why are the cities so important? Well, they're important because they are powerful economically, I think. Why does this happen? Every city in the world has a, a cluster in the middle, a high-density hub. It works whether you're a small village at the crossroads, you have two shops, a bar and a bank, and, and all cluster on that crossroads. They don't spread evenly throughout the village, they cluster together. It works in a small town where they cluster on the high street. You know, the, the solicitor, the estate agent, all the shops, they cluster together. It's a natural thing to do. And it works in these massive New York, Shanghai, London. But at all scales, this, this is desire of businesses to cluster together is, is strong, really strong. And cities are only there because the productivity gains that, they, that their density and their facilities provide outweigh the other cost. This is a, this is a private sector driven motivation, money driven motivation basically. Businesses are making individual decisions which says I'll pay rent that's 50% higher, double what I could get further out in the suburbs, but 
because I get more out of being within that cluster. It's important to my business to be within there. They recognize the benefits that they get. And in the literature, the benefits of that density or agglomeration come largely in three areas. One is labor. If you're in the middle, if you were a, a management consultant in an, in an office quite like this, you'd have your pick of, of all the management consultancy staff. Anyone working in central Auckland would say, yeah, this, this place is fine for me. Whereas if your office was 15 kilometers out of town, your labor catchment would be much smaller. You, you wouldn't have the same choice. You wouldn't be able to get exactly the person that you were looking for. But if you're going to get it, here's the place for you. So labor market works better. So does product market. If you're, if you're a lawyer in central Auckland, you've got to be pretty good because there's lots of other lawyers all competing. And my guess, I don't know lawyers in central Auckland, but my guess is they specialize quite heavily. Certainly in London, that you, there are no general lawyers. So you have to specialize because there's just too many. And you've got to be really good at the little bit that you do to compete in that market. And that specialization drives innovation and new ideas and more productivity and, and, and drives the whole industry. So that competition is really important. And the third and kind of the, the sweet, nice one is, is that ideas spread really fast within a cluster. And if you're not in the cluster, you can, you can miss that and your business can be dead in six months because you haven't heard about this new revolutionary way of, of doing things. So that soft exchanging of ideas, whether it's at a, a sort of conference or a talk like this, or, or whether it's, so oh, I met so-and-so down the pub last night, do you know what they're doing? They're do and that, that spreading of ideas is vital to, to clusters and their success. And it's hugely important. We've just, I finished something in Melbourne, oh, I know, six or seven months ago. Two things to note here. One, this tiny inner red area, central Melbourne, is responsible for 32% of the entire output of Victoria. Victoria being much, much bigger than the, the city of Melbourne, or which this is. The second is that there is a 50, more than 50% productivity premium being in the centre compared to anywhere else. And that's not all agglomeration. A significant chunk of that is, is different mix of, of jobs there. So you don't get many merchant bankers locating down here or many corporate headquarters up there, they, they tend so part of that is what types of job they are in there. But the evidence is very strong that no matter what types are in there, they all become more efficient if you cluster them closer together. And what's the role of rail in doing that? Well, rail is able to provide huge capacity to one point in a way that no other mode can. You, know, you, can, you can be, well, in Hong Kong, the, the biggest capacity metro in the world, but Hong Kong delivers 85,000 passengers per hour in each direction. So one station, in theory, could push up 170,000 people an hour to the surface. Yes, yeah, massive. Now, that's extreme. But that high number of people is important, and it's particularly important to property developers. You're going to make a huge investment, hundreds of millions, in a, in a big office block, you're not going to do it on the basis of a bus stop or even a road. It's not enough. So rail tends to attract those, those big developments and it encourages that high density development, de-risks it a lot for that. It's very permanent rail. Almost never goes away once it's in place. And part of that is, is because the land use reinforces the importance of the rail, as, as we've talked about before. Rail has one other key advantage, which is that it provides that capacity without taking up your road space. And I don't say that to enable you to let more cars drive into your city centre. I say that because quality of place, niceness of your environment is increasingly important in this world. Really is. Labour is, is now mobile to a degree that, that it's never been before. And it's mobile internationally, not just nationally. And there's a load of evidence, particularly from the US, <coughs> that all the US growth in the last 20 years has come in nice cities. Cities with nice climates, city with sea, or cities with mountains, but not nasty cities. So, and that, that's labor choosing where they want to work. You know, given a choice of, of location, oh, I'll go to the nice one, thank you. And obviously that's one of Auckland's key strengths, and you need to play on it. And you need to keep your city as a, as a beautiful, nice city. A couple more, just briefly. There's a real benefit to residential density. 
which is not generally picked up. And there's a fascinating research document that I found in Australia recently, which said that the difference in the costs of serving sprawling on the outside of Perth, it was in Perth, compared to infill development near the centre of Perth, was $80,000 per dwelling. Roughly half of that was on utilities, and the other half of it was on public services, the costs of providing public services in remote rather than central places. Providing health care where you didn't have any GPs, you didn't have any hospitals, compared to squeezing a bit more through stuff that you already have. So that's a big, big financial issue about sprawl. Those tend to be private sector location decisions. They're not taking account of public sector costs in that. And the other one is the environment. And of course, density uses less land. Density leads to much more public transport, much less car use because you can walk, you can cycle, you have other options. It reduces emissions, they're safer, they're less noisy, those sorts of things that I'm sure you understand. You have a low density sprawling city here. There's no question about that. I have a friend who lives up in Fongaparo, which is a, quite a distance to commute into central Auckland by car, but that's what he does. It is though, a very attractive city with fantastic harbour and hills. I love hilly cities, it's great. You have quite a small CBD for the size of your city, 15, 14% of your employment in, in the middle. In London, it's closer to a third. In Sydney, it's, it's 21, 22%. Melbourne, 27, 28%, something like that. They're a bit difficult, those numbers, because it depends on how you define the CBD and how you define the whole city. But, but nonetheless, I think Auckland is pretty low. And part of that, I think, is politics because I'm told, I wasn't here, that there was a strategy to kind of spread jobs around, give all of the local authorities their own little centre rather than, than one. Me, I would, and you now have one Auckland, there's a clear political push to grow the centre and I'm sure that's the best thing you can do in terms of your economy and growth. Absolutely positive. The question is how you provide the capacity to, to enable that growth to take place. Transport's a great enabler. Doesn't, it won't work if no one wants to, to grow there, but if it does, you need the transport to get them there. You've got to have that capacity. I don't think there's any realistic prospect of you putting big new highways into the city centre. I hope not. I don't think it would be a very efficient solution. So I think it has to be supplied by public transport. My guess is all the growth and employment in central Auckland needs to be delivered by public transport, which will be a mix of rail and bus. The two I've sort of tried to compare a bit. Rail, huge capacity, very high reliability, very good quality service, major impacts on development patterns, and hence productivity. Leaves you free with the surface, there's only one real downside to rail, and that's it's phenomenally expensive. I spent oh, seven years of my life getting government in the UK to pay for the Crossrail scheme, which was a £16 billion public transport project. It only happened, we'd, we'd, I had two goes previously in the 90s, it only happened when we turned it from a transport project to an investment in economic growth. That's what this, this railway Crossrail was for. It's investing in growth. Central London couldn't grow without more capacity. When Crossrail cross was in construction, might start in 2018, so there's still a while to go yet, but when it does, there'll be potential for another 100,000 jobs in Central London. 100,000 out of a current 1.3 million, significant increase. Bus, I mean buses are fantastic, highly flexible, Great modes of transport, but difficult for big city centres. They don't generally encourage big developments to take place along them. And they're not particularly nice to have roaring around your city centres, particularly not in huge volumes. It's fine to have a bus rolling past once a minute or once every two minutes. When you get to 200 buses an hour, that, that's not fine, that's, that's not so nice. We have 
Oxford Street, supposedly our premier shopping street in London, is, is absolutely ruined by a solid red wall of buses going in either direction from, from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. So we need to use buses, there's no doubt about it. The, the rail, whatever rail you do here, is not going to serve more than two or three or maybe four corridors. So, so there's a whole chunk left that's going to have to come by bus. And you've got a hugely successful bus park and ride on, on the motorway to the north. I think rail is going to have to be the backbone for you. I, I can't see you doing it without rail. It's a, it's a difficult to get government over the line. It's a lot of money, and, and it, it has elements of a leap of faith in it. I, you, you can only really invest it if you're expecting that change in density, that change in distribution of population employment to follow. If it's just a transport scheme, and that's all it does, it doesn't change anything else, then buses are very cheap and very hard to, to compete with. But, but I think to, to really make this city grow and, and meet its potential in the future, rail is, is your only way.